We have to weed a lot of the algae if it grows too much in the tank. She has to get in periodically. If a coral gets knocked over, she has to go ahead and pick the coral up and put it back into place. Now, if we can get Dottie's attention and see if she can come up, if you have any questions or you want to specifically ask Dottie about her role as a caretaker of our living model ecosystems, yeah, um, I was uh, wondering if there's any aspects of the ecosystem that you can't take care of. There's something that's like out of your hands that you can't really uh, handle. That's a really good question, Ronnie. We had uh, a couple of months ago a bloom of dinoflagellates. I don't know if you guys know what those are. Those are tiny little microscopic plant-like things. And some of them are toxic. They're what cause red tides, if you've heard of the, ever heard of that. What happens is they, they bloom and then they get eaten by the grazers, things like sea urchins or snails or certain kinds of fish. Then those toxins accumulate in the bodies of the animals that have eaten them and they can eventually kill them. And that happened here in our system. Scientists don't know what caused dinoflagellates to bloom. Uh, but whatever causes them to bloom, we have that cause here in our model ecosystems. The only way really for us to deal with it was to run special filters on to try to get the dinoflagellates di out, weed out some of the kinds of algae the dinoflagellates would live on, uh, and try to take animals out that we thought might eat the dinoflagellates. Uh, so that's a, a very good question. Yes, there are some things that we can't control completely, but they are natural things that occur in, in wild ecosystems. And today we're here with Dr. Karen Chin. Hello. Hi, Alice. Now, you have a very, very unique field of study. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, actually, Alice and I study coprolites, which are actually fossil feces. So, and you study dinosaur droppings? Dinosaur droppings and other kinds of fossil animal droppings as well, yes. But they're fossil. They've actually turned to rock. A person in paleontology doesn't necessarily just study dinosaurs. There are other things that they can study. Oh, yes. Not only dinosaurs, not only just bones, but people can study lots of old things. Like what? You can study old bones from other animals, or you can study trace fossils. Bones are actually body fossils. They tell us about what an animal looked like. But trace fossils tell us about an animal's activities, things like tracks and coprolites and eggshells, too. So what information can you gain from the coprolites? Coprolites. Coprolites. <laughs> well, they tell us a little bit about what an animal is feeding on. The only problem is, because it's a trace fossil, we can't always tell who was responsible, or as I like to say, who dung it. Why don't we take a look at, at this explanation about how we uh, organize our pages into signatures, and I think that will help explain the process. printer sequence is called a flat. Two flats printed back to back make up a 16 page signature. Notice that with the exception of one spread, no two facing pages are aligned together. But once the sheet is folded and trimmed, the pages will appear in sequential order. This process is important because it ensures all the pages will be bound in the proper order. After all the signatures are folded, they are sewn together to create a book. Do models have? Well, we saw, yeah, we saw those just a few minutes ago. Here they are right in front of you. This is the little, look at that little tiny engine on the front of that. That's CO2. It's run by CO2, and it's an engine. It, it flies that airplane very nicely. On the other hand, what do you think would happen if we tried to put that engine on that model? It wouldn't work. Now, please understand, this is not the largest engines that we're running now. We have some that are uh, well over twice to three times the size of this engine on model airplanes at this point. And uh, so things have really, really changed quite a bit. We have a wide range. An inter another interesting model that you might look at, and you can see what they've done with the, look at the engine in this. It's, it's uh, somewhat smaller. This is a speed model. This will go well over 200 and uh, around 250 miles an hour. And uh, you notice the wings are made of metal. You cut across, remove the top. And then we have something like this. The top has been removed from this cast, and you can see the matrix is exposed. And there are some lines drawn on the matrix to indicate where the bone is 
in here to help us in preparation. So this is not something you actually collected yourself, so what's in here is unknown to you. That's right. All we have are the, the clues to go by the people in the field. Okay. Now, there are different types of methods of preparation. What techniques do you use or what are they? Well, there are two main types of preparation. There's mechanical preparation in which we use hand tools to physically scrape away rock from surrounding the bone. And there's also chemical preparation. And for that, we use chemicals to dissolve the rock from around the bone. After we're finished with pre preparation, we do molding and casting. And that makes copies of the bones that we can train with other people. So with these variety of techniques, you do all of them up here in the front lab. And one that was of interest was one you were telling me earlier. This I find hard to believe, but you're telling me there's a fish in here. That's right. Um, you find these sometimes even fish-shaped rocks, and you take a hammer to it, and you can crack it open, and it opens right to the point of the fossil because that's the weak spot in the rock.